It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 24th lecture, Muras Lecture. This event was started in 1981 by the Muras Students Association to bring in high profile people to speak on agricultural and agribusiness issues and to share their experience with Muras students, industry and the community. would like to first of all thank you very much for inviting me up here uh, to speak. Um, it's quite a few years since uh, I was the age of most of the students here uh, and um, b before I sort of go to the slides and uh, go through um, I was asked to tell my story uh, and my story actually started uh, in England and I thought maybe some of the things that happened to me along the years, I won't go into too much detail because it is rather long, um, would, would sort of be of some relevance to, uh, uh, to the students and uh, uh, give you some insights as to how somebody who was so far away, from, born so far away from a farm, it wasn't true, uh, who had n no knowledge of animals or anything else, suddenly sort of ended up uh, speaking to you today. Um, and it, I, I was a, uh, came out to Australia when I, from England when I was 19, just heading on for 20, as a 10 pound pom. This is as far as you could get from England in those days for 10 pounds, and so uh, I was pretty quick to take the opportunity. When I got here um, uh, at that age, you, you had the, the risk of being called up for national service, but I got balloted out, and, and uh, as a result, uh, decided to go to university uh, uh, to do something useful. You had an obligation to stay in the country for two years. During that time, I switched to law and ended up uh, finishing uh, a law degree. And I was the first person in my family, for probably quite a few generations, to achieve, uh, to achieve that, and I thought I'd done pretty well. Uh, then I got a job with one of the law firms in Perth, um, worked hard, and focused, uh, as I went through, on trying to differentiate myself. I think it's one of the things a lot of people don't understand when they start work, that uh, they actually, it's really just the start of the, uh, the learning curve and you actually have to find out what makes you special, what makes you important and if, as in my case, there wasn't anything particular to start with, you actually have to find it and develop it. So in those circ uh, what happened was uh, I was appointed a partner in the firm I was with, it was one of the best firms in town in those days, uh, still is actually, it's the biggest law firm in Australia today, and um, developed a, an international legal practice as I went on. That enabled me to travel around the world first class, in those days lawyers travelled first class, uh, today uh, they wouldn't dare. Um, but in those days, um, I would fly into London, to Zurich, and to other, New York and other places, and uh, thought, this is as good as it gets. Uh, I'm well paid, I'm traveling the world, and I'm doing really intellectually stimulating, interesting work in the international corporate finance field. Um, and then, uh, uh, as luck would have it, uh, I became associated with a, a couple of other lawyers. I should warn you about going into partnerships with lawyers. Uh, it uh, often has a bad end. A and um, w w it was the 80s, and we decided that um, it would be good to uh, uh, do a home support. It's probably the best way I can describe it, and that is take over a public company and, uh, and uh, make some money on the stock market. Um, unfortunately, we did that just before September 1987 when the stock market crashed uh, and uh, the company that we had uh, decided to, uh, targeted was a company called Peters WA Limited, uh, a venerable old company, uh, probably the first company, to, one of the first companies to be listed on the stock exchange here in Western Australia. And um, as we uh, completed the takeover offer, uh, the market collapsed and the banks uh, said, unless you actually go and run it, um, we're going to uh, uh, take action because uh, the year we'd completed the takeover, Peters had lost, I think, about $10 million, sacked 120 people and was in all sorts of trouble. So um, my entry into agribusiness was as CEO of Peters and Browns, uh, emerged as a good word, uh, Mitch. <laughs> um, I, I would say to start off with, it was a reluctant move because I actually had a nice office overlooking Perth Water, uh, a car bay in the city. These are the sorts of things you aspire to when you're a, uh, a junior lawyer. A and um, uh, to give that up and uh, uh, get an office in Scarborough Beach Road overlooking a car park um, wasn't exactly a, a good trade. The thing that worried me most at the time was that uh, 
uh, uh, was that the intellectual challenge that I'd got doing international finance, tax work across jurisdictions would be lost, that I, I, wouldn't, be, uh, I wouldn't have that level of interest. And so I largely envisaged my job as being one of sorting out the problems of the company, getting it ready and, uh, and selling it on to, uh, to somebody who would uh, uh, look after it and, uh, and take it to where it needed to be taken. But um, um, I was wrong about two things. First of all, um, the intellectual challenge and the excitement that you can get from agribusiness uh, hooked me in quite quickly. And uh, I soon realised that the, uh, the challenges that uh, agribusiness present in terms of working things out and developing business models and all the sorts of things that uh, uh, you have, get, you're going to experience and I think enjoy, um, that was... Um, uh, that was equal to wh whatever I'd been doing before. And I've stayed in agribusiness and not ventured back to the law. Uh, and uh, th th in terms of um, its ability to, um, to, to, in terms of the uh, ability to turn the business of Peters around and to develop a, uh, uh, n new markets and new products and uh, uh, work with farmers uh, to, to achieve that, um, that's been really the most rewarding and satisfying uh, period of my life. Um, it's still continuing, I might add, but uh, uh, back in those days, uh, uh, I was totally new to dairy, totally new to farms, totally new to a farmer's way of thinking. And um, I must say that um, learning, that, that journey of learning uh, to work with the bush, to do it well, uh, has been um, one of the most rewarding in my life. So I, I, I won't, I, I'll try and sort of explain as we go along so, with some anecdotes rather than the story because frankly the story requires a, a book uh, because there really were so many things that went on, so many crises, so many difficulties. Uh, and uh, what I really want to do is just sort of pick on uh, anecdotes which basically illustrate a point, hopefully, uh, that is of relevance to you and uh, will give you some uh, feel for some of the things that we're doing now, which we'll come on to and talk about in a minute. The first thing is that, the, as I said, the, the business of Peters and Browns was a venerable old business. It um, suffered from a number of things, not the least of which was a St George's Terrace board that really knew nothing about the business. And uh, I guess the first thing that uh, we realised uh, when we went in there was that um, in a mature market business, this is the dairy industry in Western Australia, um, and in a, a highly competitive business, the ice cream business as it was then in Western Australia, uh, the board had invested all of the money in building a, a, an ice cream plant which uh, basically had nowhere to go. So the challenge facing the business was, was basically twofold. The first was find a way of making the ice cream plant, which had soaked up all the company's money, uh, a profitable business uh, from Western Australia. Uh, and you've got to bear in mind, you're competing with companies like Unilever and Nestle and huge, huge corporations, multinational corporations, uh, not an easy task. Uh, and secondly, um, with the dairy business, which in those days was uh, uh, still is Brown's, but it also was Peter's uh, milk in those days, um, to find a way of protecting that uh, business in face of deregulation. Uh, that was uh, going to be a major challenge for, for the processes at that time, uh, and the path of deregulation was just starting. So our first objective then was to solve the ice cream plant problems, and we did that by uh, focusing on export market development. Uh, we actually worked out that it was harder to sell ice cream across to the East Coast than it was to sell it in Japan. And uh, it, Peters and Browns became the first company to successfully export ice cream to Japan and actually became the largest producer of ice cream in the Southern Hemisphere. It achieved that um, using um, good quality West Australian milk um, and um, strategies that uh, uh, enabled it to produce very high quality uh, ice cream. So th the first thing it did was basically explain to everybody in Western Australia that you can actually produce from WA products which can be sold internationally and sold successfully against competition from everywhere. Um, th that often the, the way to do that is not to focus on necessarily on Australian markets, although they're always valuable and near at hand, but to often see ourselves as part of the region and focus on Japan and Asian markets. 
Um, but I, I want to tell you just a, um, a, li a, a little um, problem that came about. When, when we first started talking to the, to the Japanese about uh, ice cream, uh, I calculated how much milk they would require for the amount of ice cream they wanted. Um, and it was the entire state's milk supply for the initial forecast. Uh, and they wanted us to be prepared to supply more. The contract that we negotiated at the time initially started off at $100 million. That was the size of the contract. And to show you the impact it had at that time, we were on national television uh, as that contract was awarded. And actually, actually what happened just before we won it, the Kiwis snuck in, and, uh, as, they, as they want to do, and, and stole uh, $40 million worth of the contract, uh, which was the supply of vanilla ice cream, which was uh, a, a blessing in disguise for us because um, we got all the hard stuff to do. And as a result of getting all the hard stuff to do, uh, that is the more sophisticated flavours, the more complicated products and everything else, um, uh, we developed levels of expertise that uh, uh, we hadn't seen before. But in trying to get uh, that sort of milk supply for the Japanese market, even at the reduced level of the contract, um, we faced a, a major problem. We just didn't have the milk. But our research had shown that consumers in Western Australia uh, who bought Peter's two litre ice cream um, couldn't distinguish between um, vanilla if it was made from butter oil and vanilla if it was made from cream, fresh cream. Uh, the, the, the significance of that was that we were in a position where we could substitute vanilla uh, butter oil in, in, in our ice cream in Perth and take the fresh cream and send it to Japan. As a result, we doubled the business overnight, but, and then we went back to the farmers, having done that, and won the contract, and got them to lift their milk supply in the assured contract that, uh, uh, that in doing so, they would be able to sell the milk and, and uh, um, you know, continue to benefit from uh, the increased volumes going forward. So, it, this issue of finding a way to beat the scale challenges that come from Asia is one of the major problems facing anybody in agribusiness who looks towards Asia and says, uh, this is the market opportunity. Um, we are really a minnow in production. You'll see a slide later in which we talk about um, Chinese pork production. Now, as, sorry? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. One of the benefits of having a an assistant. <laughs> um, Rabobank here have, uh, uh, it's a, there's a reference here to the Rabobank report, um, which uh, basically says that um, um, China has reduced its pig herd by um, 30%. Uh, I think we're all, many people will be aware that the Chinese are having enormous problems with uh, um, environmental issues, food safety issues, and increasing demand. I mean, uh, pork is actually the most widely consumed protein in the world, probably close to chicken, but uh, the Chinese make the difference. So if you reduce their um, herd by 30%, it's a, it's, it's a massive change in the world, in the global supply position. Uh, to give you an example of what it means, that's to replace it is equal to the entire herd, uh, the, the entire supply of the US and Canada which we've always thought of as enormous pig producers. So um, when you start looking at these sorts of scale issues, um, finding clever ways to punch above our weight becomes one of our highest priorities. And um, uh, I'll talk more about that and how we uh, sort of seek to, to go forward with that. But, um, uh, you know, that, that um, first issue, the, the development of Asian markets, uh, the focus on Japan, I know everybody talks China these days, but I'm actually a, 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 a very much a fan of dealing with the Japanese market. It's the toughest market, but it's generally speaking one of the most reliable and uh, they keep their word. They don't copy everything you do and, uh, 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 and try and cheat you. Uh, and uh, that's not for publication, uh, Peter. <laughs> um, I might get a Chinese customer one day. And I <laughs> so, you know, the, the fact is that you have to take these things into account when you're, when you're planning businesses and, and developing businesses. So 
let's um, go on to look at the, uh, um, at the, the presentation, if you can go back to the beginning, Adam, and let me just sort of tell you about Milne Agri Group first. First of all, it's a private family-owned company. I should explain, sorry, preface it by saying I, I sold out of Peters and Browns in uh, 2002 uh, and uh, res resigned uh, as managing director and, and took what was the, um, the agribusiness group uh, of Peters and Browns, which had been sold off as part of a plan to float Peters and Browns, and, and I took repurchase that basically. That involved uh, um, uh, doing a deal with Rural Traders Cooperative uh, to get back assets that had been sold to them, uh, which at the time enabled them to repay a whole load of farmers' uh, money that were owed. So uh, since then, it's been a privately fa uh, private uh, family business. Um, we're a f family business. My son's uh, and in charge of business development. Uh, I have another son who's in charge of uh, computer systems and another one who's a, a daughter who's a, a, my oldest daughter's a, a lawyer uh, and also works in the company. Um, we pioneered at that time free range chicken farming. Sorry, was that? Okay. Um, and um, what happened was uh, as I left Peters and Browns, I realised people didn't trust big food. Um, that uh, and that animal ethics and animal welfare were becoming increasingly important issues to consumers. And the, 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 from my point of view, frankly, I'd made enough money to not actually feel that uh, I was going to earn any, uh, that I didn't feel I ever needed to earn money by exploiting animals. A and um, uh, I don't think that's inconsistent um, with the bush but it's, uh, it's certainly uh, been a, a key tenet of our business. Um, <coughs> just, just before you go, I just want to talk about this. Um, we also uh, had pioneered, when I was actually at Peter's, uh, free-range pork production. So what will, to many, seem like an overnight success story because uh, uh, the pig business has really taken off in the last few years, um, uh, was actually started in the early 90s. and. Uh, uh, I thought then and still think today that uh, Western Australia has enormous potential as a, uh, as a producer of pigs um, and it has the ability to do this, uh, uh, you know, to operate in respect to a, one of the major proteins in the world and to do it with differentiation, with uh, uh, um, a point of difference. Uh, and finally, of course, Milne Feeds. Milne Feeds is actually where I started in business. Uh, in uh, 1987, it was the first company uh, uh, I acquired, uh, and um, um, Milne Feeds uh, had been through a, a, a bit of trouble in, in its time with RTC, uh, and since uh, reacquiring it, uh, uh, it's been repositioned as a major supplier of ruminant feed in Western Australia, including the investment of some $8 million in developing new technologies, which are used to feed quite a few lambs in Western Australia and certainly a lot of cattle as well. So, go on to the next one. Before I do, uh, move from the slide, unfortunately uh, uh, something's gone wrong with the, uh, with the lines on the graph here, but what that side of the slide showed, it's an APL, extract from an APL report, which shows that within Australia, um, the supermarket chains driving down the price of chicken um, are now trying to take extra profits out of pork and out of beef. Um, at the same time, of course, uh, they're constrained in terms of what they can do in respect to those products because of um, the limited supply uh, that's available. So we're a beneficiary of that in respect to uh, pork at least. Um, and because we have a differentiated product, uh, a free range product, which uh, has uh, um, a significant point of difference for most consumers, um, even though they are cutting the price of chicken uh, to very low levels. It's on the commodity chickens and as a result we're not significantly impacted. But um, the outlook in both uh, pork and beef uh, is for very strong growth um, going forward. <coughs> Sorry, just go back. Free range is easy to claim, hard to achieve. Um, there's a reason why uh, people fudge it. It's because it's not easy to do. And um, I think one of the key differences between us and the, the other people that claim to be free range is that uh, that's all we do. Um, we actually don't produce intensive, uh, we don't engage in intensive animal production at all. 
uh, and fundamentally the right of an animal to, uh, uh, to move and to, ex you know, to uh, enjoy a normal life as far as practical within a husbandry system is really fundamental to everything we're about as a company. As I said, uh, you're a bit quick there. <laughs> yeah, just, just uh, in terms of our pork production system, um, I won't go through all the detail of it with you. As I say, it will be available in the slide, but fundamentally, the industry has got together and formed a, a standard called APIC, which is um, a serious standard. Uh, and uh, we are probably one of the few producers in the country that can meet that standard. Uh, one of the problems that we're getting with standards is that they're not getting necessarily, it's not fair to say they're necessarily corrupted, but they're, they're, they're getting blurred. Um, uh, you know, RSPCA certified us as the only free-range chicken producers in Australia, the first in Western Australia, uh, at the start of their decision to move into uh, certification systems. But more recently, they've decided to certify um, the uh, husbandry standards in intensive production and not to certify free-range. Um, obviously, um, that gives them a $40 million check from the supermarket chains as opposed to, not for publication again, Peter, uh, as opposed to the very little um, that we, obviously, as one producer, used to pay. So we just need to understand that uh, integrity and authenticity in these supply chains will be critical. Um, going forward, if we're to succeed in China and, uh, uh, and uh, Japan and other markets, some form of valid certification is going to be um, vital. Um, at the moment, I think Mount Barker Chicken is a trusted brand and consumers uh, rely on our position, but um, uh, it's very hard to tell um, somebody in Japan where Mount Barker is. And uh, there's a role for government in, in these areas um, in uh, making sure that uh, uh, misrepresentation is, or provenance is not easily abused. This term provenance is really quite an important term to us. It's the system of production. It's the, uh, I, I'm not sure whether it's a term you focus on in your course, but it's something that everybody uh, should be well aware of because this is the differentiation, the point of differentiation for, uh, for food manufacturers and for primary producers. Uh, this is where we've got to try and uh, focus our efforts to find ways of uh, developing provenance for our products and in the same way as uh, the French do with their Appellation Control A. Excuse my French, it's probably not very good, but you know what I mean. The, um, the name Champagne and the other names, uh, we have to look to do the same for Western Australia. So these are some of our pigs. We started off, look, free range pigs are, are not easy. Uh, pigs are an extremely um, destructive animal from the environmental point of view. You really do have to work it hard to uh, Thanks. Uh, you really do have to um, um, work hard. It's taken many years to develop uh, a system that works not only on farm but also for the farmers. Uh, and uh, uh, we've now achieved that. There is a, a landline clip um, which actually looks at our farms. Um, um, it's, I think, if you Google free ranges uh, and, uh, and pork. You'll, you'll um, pick up the, uh, the landline story. And it's useful because it shows a, a family farm, a family getting back to a farm, uh, being able to get onto a farm and set one up because they're doing free range pork under our uh, uh, production model. <coughs> free range chicken involves a higher capital investment, but uh, uh, it uh, certainly uh, is also one where we work closely with, with growers and uh, um, the, there are significant difference, differences between our production model and, and others. Um, these are um, the, the latest version. Look, it's not a, you, you don't develop these systems and that's it. You actually continue to evolve and improve them. Um, these are, unfortunately you can't see the full building here, but this is a, a movable coop. Um, so we actually are able to ensure that the chickens for most of their lives don't touch concrete, they're on litter, in a coop, uh, and we maintain the animal health by moving the coop uh, and basically then removing the, uh, the litter and, uh, and in this way um, we're able to um, uh, keep the health status, uh, avoid the use of antibiotics and uh, 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 deliver our promise. Um, just before you go, there's one more. 
just, just down in the corner there, look, I'm sorry it's such a poor picture, um, but that's uh, a picture of our products in supermarkets. Um, it's not enough to just be producing the animals effectively on, uh, on farm. You've got to then be able to take it through to something the co consumer uh, wants and needs. And um, you'll see as we go forward, uh, sorry, there's another shot of the chickens, and another one. Uh, that, this is what I wanted. Um, this is, uh, so we've, we've taken the original concept of just simple free range chicken, which you cook up, and we've turned it into a convenience food. Chicken was always a convenience food because of its relatively short cooking time, but um, that's not enough for today's consumer. Uh, you've got to put the sauce with it and uh, you know, say press here and it will be ready. Um, so um, we've done that with a significant investment in our facility at Rockingham. Uh, there we've um, uh, built a, a ready to cook facility. A and for example, uh, it's, a, it's our, last year it grew in sales, grew by 35%. And for this coming year, we've just secured a contract, another contract, a supply contract, which is worth $15 million for this year. So we'll get another 35% growth uh, this year. So fast growing segment of the market. Again, what's the benefit? It's not just that it's uh, selling chicken, it's differentiated. It makes it harder for somebody else to copy your product and say uh, ours is the same, but it's cheaper. Um, and uh, this, is, um, th this is key to marketing. So the, um, the, the Rockingham plant um, uh, takes us to a new level and we're investing a, 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 another significant amount of money in that plant uh, this year. So we see that, I, when, when I was, yeah, we see that as the, as the way into Asia as well because as you produce these sorts of products, you get the opportunity to add shelf life. And um, uh, you know, a product in a marinade lasts longer than one that's just prime meat. So there's uh, uh, there's a reason beyond just the, the the local market, and we supply these products across Australia. So the <coughs> one of the questions I was asked when uh, uh, I was initially invited was to talk about a joint venture we'd formed with uh, Hancock Prospecting, which has uh, since been dissolved. Um, w w apart from dairy and ice cream and uh, all these other activities, um, uh, w we also spent a, a fair amount of time in the last uh, 30 years um, developing um, beef operations in the northwest of Western Australia on Liveringa and Nerima stations. Uh, Liveringa and Nerima, uh, Liveringa in particular, has a large irrigation farm on it as well, which we uh, developed and we were the major supplier of uh, uh, feed products in the form of uh, compressed baled silage in the north of uh, in the north of Australia to all the pastoralists up there. Um, our, our business plan for that is still something that's relevant. We've, as I said, sold the uh, our interest in the stations to uh, Hancock, but um, we uh, are still keen to see the development of the business model that we had uh, uh, been pursuing, which was to use the northwest as a incubator to produce young cattle, uh, to then truck them south uh, and to adjust and finish them in the southern pastures in the off season for the north and the on season for the south uh, and, uh, and then take them through southern processing facilities and onto export markets. I'm not a great fan of live export. Again, don't want to publish that, <laughs> but um, for, for all the reasons that sort of underpin our group uh, and, uh, um, you know, our strategy was to try and develop an alternative for, for pastoralists uh, uh, that gave them the option, not the compulsion, but the option to go south. Um, it's been a very successful uh, business model uh, and one that uh, I think a, a fair number of pastoralists uh, are pursuing this year and likely to pursue in future years. Uh, the stimulus this year is obviously the dry conditions up north, but um, in future years I think many of them are going to find that this actually works. So it's just another example of developing a new business model and, and trying to change the rules to, uh, um, to in this case, reduce dependence on Indonesia. Um, when I was, uh, whenever I looked at the Indonesian market, I thought it's a basket case and anybody who invests on the back of it uh, is, uh, is taking unnecessary risk. Um, so it's an option which we're still trying to develop. And uh, <coughs> next week um, we launch our beef range. We have actually had a beef range under the Liveringa brand, uh, but we've sold that with the stations uh, uh, and uh, uh, we'll be launching at uh, a new, as Milne uh, 
Milne Pastoral Co. And what we'll be doing with that is, again, value-added, innovative products and looking for differentiation. So I was asked to sort of um, tell my story, and that's a, a bit of it, um, and to also talk about uh, a vision, my, my, how I see WA agriculture. I won't say it's my vision for WA agriculture, I hate the word vision, um, but um, I'll tell you how we come, uh, we come at the issue. The first thing is, is uh, we need to start with the basics, and um, you know, one thing is for certain is that uh, Agriculture has been around for a long time, and obviously will be around for a lot longer. And it's and the, the the guiding principle has always been that there's the tree and the fruit, and we can eat the fruit, but we've got to save the tree. Um, but it's more that's a metaphor. It's more than about the harvesting of apples. That's actually uh, a, a metaphor for the whole business of agribusiness in terms of uh, its achieving sustainability for business systems. And uh, in a talk I gave at UWA, I suggested that um, um, all of these, uh, all of that imagery could be, is really just referring to an agribusiness supply chain. <coughs> and I suggested that we should call these trees agri-trees. And the reason for that was, it wasn't just a semantic choice, it was because a tree represents something which is in the earth. And one of the key differences between agribusiness, obviously, and everything else is we're dealing with the, we're dealing with the land. And uh, uh, with the land goes cultural, social, as well as economic uh, uh, connections. And uh, as a result, um, you can't just look at it as a manufacturing system or a production system. The... Um, Agri trees we have have grown out of history and our isolation and our need to find export markets. I mean, Western Australia has done remarkably well in my view. Um, it's uh, uh, produced a phenomenal wheat production system, which is, I mean, we can all see what the harvest is going to be this year if we need to have any doubt in terms of our productive capacity. But there's a lot of other examples too. Uh, and they range from sort of cheer up in the or to, uh, uh, you know, I know they've had difficult times, but the tremendous success of our wine industry. Uh, and so there's been this history of innovative uh, development of agri-trees in Western Australia. But the really large ones have, generally speaking, come about as a result of uh, protection, you know, the regulation of exports of grain and things of this nature, the, uh, the establishment of CBH and these sorts of organisations have enabled um, scale to be achieved in WA. But um, that scale is in a limited number of areas and, uh, uh, you know, we're really facing uh, another generation of opportunities when you look at the sorts of uh, supply dilemmas you're going, we're going to have in going into Asia. So uh, as I was explaining earlier with the example of the Japanese milk, uh, the Japanese ice cream and the, the milk demand, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to um, get to that position and we have to take into account uh, that since the advent of the competition policy at a national level, we really don't get the advantage of states being able to step in and uh, regulate an industry and cause it to, uh, 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 to become strong and successful. So where livestock are concerned, though, um, the, the, I, I was listening to a guy called uh, Copley yesterday, um, Greg Copley. He's a strategist, West Australian guy, who uh, um, is now a leading sort of advisor to the US governments based in Washington at a thing called the uh, Washington Institute. He's a, a strategist, he's a bit right wing. But um, he, um, he was making the point that many of the, much of the disruption and dissension that we're seeing within the world with uh, the sort of rise of Trump, the British Brexit, and these sort of unexplained things that we, we're sort of uh, uh, wrestling with at present, he was arguing uh, I don't say I necessarily agree with everything he said, was that this is because of a divide between what he called the um, urban and regional communities. Um, what he was arguing was that um, there's a difference in thinking. Uh, and he was suggesting that urban communities think short term. Um, regional communities think longer term. And, you know, my experience would be, and I 
be interested to hear your comments, that that, that generally is the case. Uh, we th we're working with production cycles, which are significantly longer in business. Uh, and uh, families are investing in farms with significantly longer time horizons in terms of their children and grandchildren uh, than uh, uh, people in, in the cities. Uh, and this um, is part of the reason why we have a, a, a disconnect in terms of the issue of animal welfare in some instances, because urban people, um, generally speaking, aren't part of the production process. And so they start by uh, thinking in terms of general philosophy, which is, you know, thou shalt not kill, I guess, is one of the, the fundamental principles we have. And uh, they then uh, don't have too much difficulty in a, uh, when they've got a full belly in extending that to say, thou shalt not kill any sentient being. And an animal is undoubtedly sentient. So our, um, our problem with them is that those of us that are in regional areas or in the country who are producing livestock are actually involved in the production system. We don't start off with the a priori assumption that thou does not, that you don't kill. We're actually in the business of producing livestock. We start off with that assumption and then we engross onto that, the requirement that the animal is treated fairly, humanely, if you like, it's not really the right word, but uh, uh, it's the best one to use, uh, th that it has a normal life, that it uh, is, not a, a, is, is not oppressed and, uh, and stressed. And those are good practices for us as farmers and producers, just simply because they enable us to um, ensure that the meat's the best quality. Um, anybody will know that a dark cutter uh, in an abattoir comes about because of stress on the meat and um, that's very much the principle upon which we run our business. We look to lower or eliminate stress as far as we can. We can't eliminate it completely because predators, noises, all sorts of things uh, will cause an animal um, stress. But um, we, we can certainly um, fine tune our production system and ensure that it minimises the risk of it. Um, Mag's been involved. I suppose I've been involved in a lot of agribusiness one way and another uh, and uh, the red is where we still are and the black is uh, um, things that are in the past and I thought it might just be interesting to, to just see the, the scope of it. Uh, one of the first businesses I was involved in was Clover Meats um, which was one of the large abattoir operators here for beef, mutton and goats. Milne Feeds of course I started there and, and back there. Uh, Brown's Dairy, Peter's Ice Cream, Borden Ice Cream in Japan. Uh, Cadbury ice cream across Australia and New Zealand, Tip Top ice cream, which was the leading brand in New Zealand, um, um, Mount Barker Free Range Chicken and Plantagenet Pork. Uh, across on the other side, the stations uh, uh, that I mentioned, uh, the large irrigation farm there, uh, and then a large number of cropping properties. Uh, uh, Jalaram, which we converted from a sheep farm to a cropping problem property, not a problem, it was a very good farm. Uh, Narratara Mount Rennie, uh, again, uh, uh, a large scale cropping operation up near Geraldton, Glengarry also near Geraldton, um, Marbling and West Marbling, there's actually one or two farms that are not on there, uh, Cheviot Hills. So there's a, there's a, uh, we've really been involved in a very wide cross section of cropping, livestock production in the north and in the south and um, yeah I guess to some extent uh, we can see, at least I can see the divide between the city and the country. There is certainly a, a, a difference in the way um, we tend to come at it from the bush. Uh, and uh, um, frankly, um, um, I, in some ways, I hope Mr. Copley, Copley, whatever, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, uh, is right. He was suggesting that uh, um, the future is what he called real production, what we do or want to do, <laughs> as opposed to um, the um, services type economy um, and uh, that, that has developed in the urban areas. And, you know, he was putting in context a, a period of uh, generations since the Second World War uh, and pointing out that, um, um, you know, that the development and economic development beforehand was very much one of um, the, the rural sector farms and uh, agribusiness, real production uh, activities were what were valued within the economy and uh, the, um, uh, you know, the artificial derivative type activities that you see in the cities in many instances were, were, were less so. It's comforting words 
for those of us in agribusiness, uh, yet to be proven, but, um, but certainly uh, uh, does suggest that uh, the real economy is having its day. One clue that might give you some confirmation of that is that years of quantitative easing in the US and elsewhere has resulted in um, um, an enormous amount of money sloshing around the world. There's a reason why interest rates are low. Uh, they've been printing money uh, like it's going out of fashion. And uh, I think one of the things, pardon? Yeah, anyway, the, 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 no, I don't know what you mean. The, the, but the, the benefit of this is that um, um, with the low interest rates, um, real assets become generally more affordable. And we've always found that the farm sector becomes more profitable as a result. So uh, there's some opportunities. Keep going. Ed. So. When you, you know, what, what I was advocating here is that uh, we, tend to not, we tend to not look at our development opportunities adequately in Western Australia. Um, we've um, got vast areas that are hampered in their development. Uh, I know the government's endeavouring to uh, open up the rangelands and uh, uh, free up access to water and things of this nature. But the, the fact is that we've got many years where we've been tying our hands behind our back in these areas and not achieving our potential. Um, the, um, uh, if we were to look at WA as a, um, a property development exercise, I mean, in one way or another, we're all property developers. In the city, you've got some high value land, which has got a skyscraper on it. In the country, you've got a farm, which is uh, giving a return, but it's a rental income that you get from your, from your asset, basically. Um, and um, the rental returns in the, in the bush have been very low. Um, and uh, have been su subject to all sorts of risk fluctuations which have meant that the asset values uh, have, unless it's sort of uh, uh, real estate that people want to acquire for lifestyle purposes, ha have not met the true potential. We're going to see an adjustment in most of these things now going forward and what it means is that uh, you know, if, the, if the government's objectives to uh, uh, double agribusiness production uh, are to be achieved, we'll need to bring in into production uh, these other, the, the, the vacant land, the land that's not being used, the water that's not being um, capitalised on, and uh, at the same time uh, uh, find ways of increasing and intensifying our production. We've got to do that in an environment where we maintain our connection with the bush, our agri-trees, <laughs> so that uh, um, we don't change the social structure and fabric of our society. And uh, as I said earlier, I think I've covered most of the points here as I've gone along, but you know, small domestic market, must export, don't have an option. Um, and I've covered this too, that we basically do that by differentiating our products, by finding unique products, uh, be it chia seeds, wine, free range chicken, free range pork, doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's those opportunities that we've got to search for. Um, they've got to, at the end of the day, produce enough cash. Next one, Adam. And, you know, a lot of people I speak to take a lot of comfort from China demand and uh, the free trade agreement and things of this nature. And I just want to uh, share my thoughts of caution. <laughs> uh, and, and say that you know the the, 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 the projections fluctuate quite a bit. Um, more recently, uh, uh, people are pointing to increasing aging population in China, the one-child policy, uh, the impact on Japan. I mean, we're seeing in Australia now we're entering into a deflationary period where prices will go down each year. Um, the supermarkets are driving it at the moment, but, but fundamentally, if that becomes endemic in the, in the economy, I can remember being in Japan where every year we went up to supply them and they basically had to see a, a price reduction each year in order to continue the business. And finding ways of doing that is very much a, a challenge um, which we're all going to face. <coughs> One of the things that um, is clear from uh, that, you know, is that it's, in WA, it's very hard for any one party to do all of these things, meet all these competitive challenges. Uh, we've got to become more cooperative. Uh, we've got to work together. I'm not advocating cooperatives. Uh, I have a lot of problems with them, frankly, but, but uh, um, we've got to find ways of cooperating uh, to, um, you know, to 
achieve scale and benefits. For example, uh, um, we're looking to export product into Hong Kong. Initially, we don't have enough, but we can form a logistics arrangement with other companies in Perth that are exporting there already, get a full container instead of a part container and change, uh, change the economics of the exercise. So there's, uh, there's those sorts of opportunities, but there's many other areas where this sort of uh, uh, cooperation is, is worthwhile. So let's just come on and talk about MAG's focus and what, we, uh, what we're trying to do. First of all, we, I, I'm looking after the experience with Peters, um, which frankly didn't end up all that well with Fonterra uh, taking over and uh, uh, you know, subsequently, uh, notwithstanding their agreements with me, breaking up the, the business, selling off the ice cream division, and, uh, uh, and basically we see uh, um, you know, a pretty sorry state in the dairy industry today. Um, I, I'm looking at what I call native agri-trees. These are ones that are rooted in our soil to such an extent that you can't actually pull them out. <laughs> and uh, they're ones that uh, give us our best chance of maintaining a production platform. Uh, and obviously we're looking to try and find ones that would enable us to develop the technical marketing skills and things of this nature. You know, in WA, if you want good marketing advice, it's a stretch. If you haven't developed it yourself or you're not a natural, um, you've got to go east uh, because it's not here. So part of what we have to do is find ways of getting homegrown businesses that are based here that can develop those things. Peter's actually used to fulfill that role. Uh, you almost used to be a training ground uh, uh, for, uh, for WA agribusiness and uh, uh, you know, we need to, um, uh, to find ways of nurturing that again. <coughs> There's a been a, there's been problems over the years, hasn't there, with um, big visions and uh, poor execution, or big visions which should never have got off the ground. Uh, and um, our analytical skills in respect to some of the projects and proposals that have been put forward have been, um, frankly, substandard. Um, what's important is that um, uh, we find a way of uh, using thorough, rigorous analysis of, uh, of these proposals uh, these agri-trees, both existing and future, and, and make sure that they're going to uh, meet the um, um, expectations uh, that we have of them. Um, I actually feel that the, the, the universities and the tertiary sector um, have a big opportunity here. Uh, I think they should have stepped up to it some time ago. MUREsk is probably an exception, but fundamentally, uh, and I, I'm aware of uh, new schools being established at, uh, at at Murdoch and elsewhere, but the, the, the fact is that um, um, there should be critical analysis on a microeconomic level of gross margins and uh, yields from in particular areas and things of this nature. A lot of that work was done in the past by the Department of Agriculture um, with its extension services, but really for quite a few years now it's been uh, uh, declining obviously as a result of budgetary constraints, but also uh, just because of a, a lack of focus on these things. So, um, you know, getting user groups to, uh, uh, to start looking at and comparing their results uh, and getting farmers to, uh, to work closely on a, a regional level, as well as industries to, uh, to critically analyse uh, uh, the various initiatives that come forward. Um, is critical. I can think of so many times over the years that I've been in agribusiness um, where a golden opportunity has been missed and the money has just been wasted. And uh, we, we really do need to stop doing this. Um, you know, um, with respect to the Minister, there's often the case in the past where uh, um, good political decisions mm. have been made, lousy business decisions. And you can't afford to make lousy business decisions because it's impossible to get the money back later. So um, in our area, our little patch of the world, um, we've sought to be in fully integrated animal protein sector. Uh, and um, our model doesn't always envisage, doesn't envisage ownership, but it does envisage control. Um, we've got to be able to speak to the customer and sell them what they're going to get and that they're going to get it at a certain point in time and we've got to deliver. There's always got to be somebody there who answers and is accountable. Um, what that means is down the, uh, down the, uh, uh, the supply chain, um, we structure agreements as much as anything else, uh, cooperative arrangements with our suppliers and partners and um, work with them to, uh, for the whole of us to get forward. So we'll talk about that now. 
So both the free range and pork businesses work on this basis. Uh, uh, the, um, the free range pork business has breeders and growers and uh, um, our role has been to obviously develop the system in the first place, uh, uh, the quality protocols, the veterinary services uh, and the other infrastructure that is the, the old farm extension service on steroids. Um, because we're not just there uh, to give them some advice and walk out, we're there uh, as uh, we have contractual arrangements which uh, uh, mean we work together. It's important for us to lead rather than push, um, but nevertheless, if, if the occasion requires, we actually have, uh, in most instances, the, uh, the power to push. The second thing we've done is uh, we develop the branding or marketing concepts. So in the case of free range pork, uh, we've secured a, a, a national contract after two years of negotiations with Coles, um, which initially started with uh, the supply of an additional uh, 1,200 free range pigs from Western Australia. The agreement itself is an exclusive agreement. Uh, they're not allowed to buy from anybody else in Australia. So that gives Western Australia a free hit. Um, it's a long term agreement. Um, and currently uh, we're negotiating to double that and to extend the, the number of years. What we look at is that in entering into these agreements, we're acting not just for ourselves, but also for our growers. A and um, we structure the agreement so that uh, um, one can't guarantee forever, but that whatever uh, changes may come, if there was ever a need to terminate supply or reduce supply, uh, that there's a sufficient notice period First, that makes sure that the farmer's got a return on his investment, and secondly, uh, that puts him in an adjustment period and enables us to adjust uh, the supply side if need be. But the outlook for this sector, as I said earlier, is really very good. Um, uh, if the Japanese came knocking on the door, uh, uh, sorry, the Chinese came knocking on the door, um, we could see that the, the southwest, which is where we find uh, uh, is the best areas for this type of pig production, um, we could see more pigs down there than sheep. As it is, uh, on current projections, we're going to end up with probably 150,000 uh, uh, pigs down there in the next two years. That's our plan. So that's um, uh, the free range pork model. In terms of free range chicken, um, there's some very big competition in the national market and um, not always the opportunity to go national with the product because of shelf life constraints, although as you can see with the value added products, we hope to overcome that. Um, uh, and there we've built a strong brand. So the Mount Barker brand is, uh, is a strong and unique brand. And uh, again, it enables us to give our growers a level of security and assurance in terms of uh, their investment and their business. So although they're part of, if you like, uh, they're working, some, one of them said to me on one occasion, well, I'm just working for you really, aren't I? Uh, and uh, you know, to some extent that's the case, but he, he, on the other hand, they've got a, an assured income. They've got, they know what the rules are and they're not dealing with, uh, with the sorts of problems that I see uh, farmers as having, which is, you know, do you sell it to a, do you listen to the advice of a man in a pink shirt or a green shirt? You know, fundamentally, uh, um, how do you know he knows anything about it? He hasn't actually got any money invested in it. Uh, he's not there, not worrying about whether he's going to get an order from you next year. Um, it's it's very much important. It's very important for farmers to develop mechanisms for accessing the market that give them some level of control. Uh, and uh, that control, as I said, I've got control on them. They got control on me. Uh, it's a two-way street. Um, I think I've probably covered most of that, um, and I'm sorry it's text, <laughs> um, I wasn't sure I remember it all. Um, the, the, but let me just finish by saying that the future of, for WA agribusiness is, is really very bright if we can uh, get around these things. Um, we, um, you know, we're looking though for, we should be selective, I mean farmers tend to be selective on the basis of, well will it give? Uh, you know, an above average return. 
um, you know, anybody can sell it for nothing. The question is, can you sell it for a price that really makes a profit? But they should also be thinking about what, what adds to the fabric of our society. And, and one of the strengths, I think, of this, uh, uh, of the free-range chicken and the free-range pork model, and the reason why I focused on it, to the exclusion of mill feeds, which is also a very interesting and successful business, is that it populates um, areas. I mean, we've, we've got these, uh, uh, you know, in grain, in our cropping operations, we're looking for scale. You know, what's the best deal you can do? Buy the neighbour's farm, <laughs> put more paddocks under, under crop. But what, what's the consequence of that? Well, we've got vast farms and they become uh, what I think of as people deserts because the, the, the small towns disappear and uh, uh, you can't get enough children for the school or even to keep the shop open. Um, so that, uh, how, do, how do we overcome that? Well, we, we obviously can't stop the march of progress in terms of cropping and uh, even some of the livestock operations, but we can look for these uh, agri-trees which can infill um, as a result of uh, uh, the pig production model. Uh, we've got something like what, 20, 24, 20 pig, and pig and chicken. We've got 24 farmers on farms in rural areas um, around Mount Barker and, uh, and in the Plantagenet region. Um, we see those numbers doubling or trebling going forward. Uh, and um, we don't really see any limitation to the growth as long as um, we can maintain the differentiation of the product and meet the consumer's expectations of free range, healthy um, products.